Yeah, so take a look at little problem in web design here. What it is is when it has the plus or minus, it just counts as two different points. Um, but let, let me show everybody what we're talking about. Those were on, let's see, the graphs assignment now. Yeah, it's on the one that's due tonight when there are a few of these. And let's find one where it's good enough to have. Okay. Yeah. So on on these where it gives you plus or minus as the input. Um, really what that's doing is that's counting as as two points um, so you would do it once with positive four and once with negative four that only matters on the graph part that you're going to have the same y value because on this like we're taking the number and we're squaring it so when we square it it's going to make it positive either way there so that's what I'm saying we'd put the parentheses in so let's look at this function we've got our function is negative x squared so in a case like that, you do have to be careful with the signs. So like if we're trying to make a table of values, so like we'll do plus or minus one, plus or minus two, and then figure out our output here. So when we do one, we have negative, and then one squared, that gives us negative one. Okay. And we, we would get the same thing if we did negative one because it's in the parentheses squared. So negative one squared would be one, and then we take the opposite of that and get negative one. Does that make sense? Yeah. But when it when it really matters on those problems is when when you're thinking about what the graph's going to look like because you'll have it on at, you'll have negative one at one, and you'll have negative one at negative one. And then same same thing with the two on this one. Right? Um, if we do negative two, negative two squared will give us positive four, but then we have to make it negative because of the minus sign out front. So on those we'll have negative four. That's all. Um, they will they will only give that to you when both of them come out the same. It's just saving you from having to do, do them all over again. Because I could have given us negative four, negative three, negative two, negative one, and then four, three, two, one. But that just saving us a little bit of work. So. And now, on one like that, we've even got a little bit of head start on picking out the graph. No, it's not going to be that one, because that would be what kind of function with the V-shape. The absolute value, that with the V-shape. So we know it can't be that one. And it can't be this one, because that's V-shape. So it's got to be one of those two. So that'll help pick out on multiple choice. Other web design questions? No? Okay. If you, you know, you can bring up old ones too. It doesn't have to be. This is just from whatever to do right at that moment. Okay. So today. We're going to be looking at some stuff from section 2.7. And section 2.7 is about putting functions together or combining functions. 
So the idea is we want to be able to do the same types of operations with functions, or as many as we can, with functions that we do with numbers. So we want to be able to talk about how to add two functions together, or how to subtract two functions, or multiply, or divide. And then we have actually one other operation that we can't just do with regular numbers, but we can do with functions that we're going to look at. It's called composition. You may have seen it before. So, let's, uh, let's look at our four basic operations. So, if we have two functions, I'm going to call one f of x. And the other one, g of x. And I want to add those two functions together. So you can think about this several different ways. There are several different interpretations. We can do it algebraically with just the algebraic expressions. And the same thing is true if we're thinking about the graphs of the two functions. Um, those are the two big ways. So... Well, I, I kind of wrote this backwards. Let me let me back up one second. One second. So if we want to do this, that's that's what we're looking for. We're trying to add two functions together. Then the way we do that is how I had it wrote down the first time. We just figure out the value of the first function, figure out the value of the second function, and then add them together. So if you see that first notation, all, it, all this is telling us is that all we have to do is we can do that second thing. We can figure out f of x, figure out g of x, and then add our answers together. Um, same thing's true with subtraction. We want to make a new function by subtracting two functions. Works just the same way. It's just figure out the value of f of x and then subtract the value of g of x, and that'll be our new function. So I know on the surface it doesn't seem like we're really doing anything. Okay. What we're saying is we can do this operation, okay? We can add or subtract these two numbers, and when we do that, we're making a new function. We're making a new function that we call either f plus g or f minus g so far so that's adding subtracting we can also make a new function by multiplying so f times g of x again it works the same way we just figure out the value of f Multiply that by the value of g, and we get the value of our new function f times g. So what are we missing? We've got addition, subtraction, multiplication, division. Division. Division's almost as simple as the other three, but Division is always kind of the troublemaker operation. So we've got to put a little note on there when we get done. So we can say that's f of x divided by g of x. But when we divide, what can we not let happen when we divide? There's some kind of forbidden thing that can happen when we're dividing that we can't allow. Can't let the bottom be zero. The bottom can't be zero because then it would be undefined. So here we'll say that's only true when g of x is not equal to zero. If g of x is zero, 
and then division will be undefined. So we wouldn't be able to get a new function that way. There are four. These are these are not a big deal to do problems with as long as you kind of have the the big picture of what's going on. Um, really, most of these problems, like if it says find the new function, then we're just combining algebraic expressions. So we're back to old stuff that we've really already been doing. Okay. Um, the part that can be a little bit trickier when we're making these new functions is thinking about the domain of the new function. Okay. Thinking about the domain of the new function. So before we get to that, let's let's do a little bit of practice with domain. Okay, we'll we'll come back to this. We'll come back to this. Um, so let's think about some of the common functions that we've been talking about. And think about what the domain of these things would be. And so remember domain is the set of all inputs that work with our function. Right? So the set of all the values that we can put into our function and get an output. That's the domain. And x, y notation we think about the set of all x's that work in our function. That will give us an f of x or a y out of our function. Okay, so let's about that function. So what x values can we plug in for x in this function and get some answer out of it? That's what we're asking when we're asking what's the domain. And kind of thinking about that the other way around, you would say, are there any x values that we could try to put in where we could not get an answer? Okay. On this one, the answer is, depending on which question you're thinking about, uh, the, the answer is no, there are not any x values that won't work. Okay. Or if you're thinking about the other way around, we can put in any real number we want to, okay. and we can get an output value. So the way we write that down, since we're we're saying every number works, every number is part of the domain, every real number, the way we write that down in the interval notation is we could say our domain goes from negative infinity to infinity. In words, you could say all real numbers are in the domain of our function. In the interval notation, you write it down that way. Think of another one. Okay. So, about this one, x cubed plus one. Can you think of any number that we could plug in for x that would give us a problem and make it where we couldn't get an answer out of our function on that one? Kind of hard to think about when there's so many numbers, right? I've got an infinite number of numbers. But this is the same situation as the last one. Okay? There's nothing going on here. We can take any number and raise it to a power that we want to. Or we can take any number and add one to it. It's no problem. So our domain, again, we would say all real numbers are in interval notation. We would And in general, anytime we have a function that's some polynomial, where we just got some different powers of x raised, yeah, different powers of x, and maybe we've got plus or minus some number, maybe we've got some coefficients in there, any polynomial we have, the domain's always going to be all real numbers, everything, negative infinity to infinity. Okay. So that's true. I mean, that's, that's true. And that's 
that's a common thing. Okay, there are an infinite number of functions out there, all these different polynomials, where our domain's all real numbers. It's no big deal. So if you run across some where the domain is just all real numbers, that's okay. Now that's normal. That's normal. It's really more unusual to have a function where there's some number that's not in the domain. Okay. Right, so let's look at a, a couple ways that can happen. Oh, well, even one more right here where the domain's all real number. We won't run across it as much, but might as well think about it. The absolute value of x. It doesn't matter what we put in there. We can get an answer out. Uh -huh. So again, the domain's all real numbers or in the interval notation, the whole number line, negative infinity to positive infinity. Uh -huh. So let's talk about what types of things would cause a problem with the domain, would make us have to leave some number out. In, in 112, in this class, we only have two different situations to be concerned with. Okay. So the first one would be a function like this. Okay. So remember, with functions, we only care about real numbers, so we're not allowing complex numbers when we talk about functions. So, can you think of any number that we could plug in, take the square root of that number, that would not give us a real number? What about, like, what if we did, like, negative one. And so if we want to take f at negative one, we get square root of negative one, and then what's the problem there? Yeah, that was that's got a negative underneath the radical, so there's not a real number whose square root is negative one. That would give us i. Right, square root of negative one would be i. So since we would get a complex number when we plug in negative one, that means that negative one is not in the domain. It's not in the domain of our function. What about negative five? Would that work? I think we'll get squared in negative five. So that would be I square root of five, so it'll be complex again, so that's not gonna work. In fact, any negative value that we try to plug in this one, it's gonna give us trouble. We won't be able to get a real number out. So for our domain, we can't have any negative numbers in there. What about zero? Does zero work? It's kind of on the fringe, so we have to stop and think about it. If we take f of zero, we'll get square root of zero. What's square root of zero? Mm -hmm. What times what gives you zero? Zero. And zero is a real number, so that's okay. So zero's in there, and zero's in the domain. Anything bigger than zeros in there, right? we could do f of 1. Square root of 1, we would get 1. Even if we get an irrational number, like if we did 2, we would get square root of 2, but that's still a real number. No i's in there, so we're okay. So as long as the number that we're plugging in for x is 0 or bigger, we get a real number out. So that is our domain. So the way we write that down is we're going to start with zero, we include zero, so we have a bracket, and then our x values can get as big as we want them to be, so we go to infinity. Okay. 
zero to infinity. Yeah, I do. yeah, yeah. It'll want it in interval notation, I think. Yeah. Good question. All right. So some variations on this one when we have the square root. It's not always just a square root with the x under there. It might be a square root of some other expression with x involved. So we need to take this same idea and be able to adjust it if we've got a little bit of different something underneath the square root. Okay. So let's, let's look at one that's just a little bit different. Okay. So here's this one. Okay. So we just figured out if we did not have the two, that our domain would be zero or bigger. Right. Anything zero or bigger. The same thing's true for the whole thing underneath the radical. Right. So we want whatever is underneath the radical to always be zero or bigger. Right. So what would what would make this zero? What will we plug in for x that would make this zero under here? Negative two. Negative two would make it zero. Okay. So negative two, if we plug it in, okay. try to f of negative two. We get negative two plus two, square root of zero, so that's zero. Okay. So that one works. So for our other x values that will work, will they have to be bigger or smaller than negative 2? So let's think if we went smaller, like if we tried negative 3, we would have negative 3 plus 2. So what kind of number would we get under here then? We would get a negative. That would get a negative and that wouldn't work. That wouldn't work. So we need all of our x values to be bigger than negative 2. So like if we went to negative one, that's bigger than negative two. That would be square root of one and that one would work. That one would work. And if you tried, any number bigger than negative two that we try will will work with this function. So our domain The smallest x value that works would be negative 2, and then they can be as big as we want them to be. That would be that one. Okay, so on that one, if you, as long as you remember the thing underneath got to be 0 or bigger, that one we can kind of look at and tell what would make it 0. And then that's the smallest x that will work. If it's something a little more complicated, we kind of need a, a method that we can use, okay? Some kind of tool we can use to figure out what our smallest x value is that will work. And then we'll know that whatever the smallest one is, that value or bigger will be our domain. So let's look at this one. This one's not too much more complicated, but it is a little bit more. There's square root of 2x plus 1. Okay. So our goal when we have a square root, we want to figure out what the smallest x value is that will work. And then we know that smallest x value or bigger will be our domain. So let's think back to the other two. Let's think back to the other two. So the smallest total that we end up with underneath our radical that works is zero. 
that square root of zero zero, and then we can get bigger from there. Um, and the same thing was true on this one, right? The total that we get underneath the radical, the smallest we can be is zero. So what we can do, and kind of our strategy, if you will, is we can take this part that's underneath the radical, and we can figure out when that will be zero, and that will tell us the smallest x value that will work in our function. Okay, so the way we do that is we just write down 2x plus 1 equals 0, and then we can solve for x. So some of you might be able to look at this one and tell what it's going to be, okay. um, but you still want to learn what to do if it's something that's too complicated for you to give the eye test to. So we just set up a little equation, whatever's underneath the radical, we set it equal to zero, and when we solve that, that's going to tell us the smallest x value okay, that will be in our domain. So here we can subtract one from both sides, and then divide both sides by two. Okay. And we get x equals negative one half. So that's going to be the smallest x value that works. So our domain would start at negative one half. We include that, and it can be as big as we want it to be. So it goes to infinity. Uh, divide, so I subtracted one from both sides, right? and then I divided both sides by two. Yeah. So over here, two over two cancels, and you had negative one over two. So, yeah. okay. You can be more technical than that, but that's gonna that's gonna pretty much do the job for us. Yeah. Figuring out the domain when we have a square root involved. Something else to take note of, if you have a square root involved, is if we have something else in, as part of our function, not just a square root, it doesn't make a difference. So if we have like, um, like we've got this function, The three x part, any any number will work with it. So we don't even care about it when we're figuring out our domain. The only part that's going to put any kind of restriction on our domain is the square root part. Okay. So we would look underneath the radical here. We'd say what number would make would give a zero underneath the radical. What number would give a zero on this one? Negative one. So negative one is going to be the smallest x value in our domain. So for this one, the domain is just negative one to infinity. Okay. So that's one thing we have to look for. And we have to make sure that whatever we have underneath the square root, that it's zero or bigger so it works. If you have a function that doesn't have a square root, then you don't have to worry about that. Okay. Question so far? Anything in there? Sorry if you're bored. I'm kind of trying to go slow through this because it's something that a lot of people typically have trouble with figuring out the domain. So, so if we have one like that, does it matter? Yeah, it doesn't matter because if if it was just the three x part, it would be negative infinity to positive infinity, right? So we don't have to leave anything out because of this part. Okay. So we can just ignore it. So we can just go to the next part. Yeah. Good question. Yeah. Okay. All right. So one other type of troublemaker that we'll have in one twelve. Okay. That would be one like this. Okay. 
So the only other thing we have to look out for when we're thinking about numbers we might need to leave out of our domain is when we have a variable in the denominator of a fraction. Okay. Here x is in the denominator. So what can x not be? I think I heard it. Can't be. It's okay if it's a negative number because one over a negative number just gives us negative. That's okay, but somebody said it? Zero. zero. It can't be zero. It can't be zero. Because if we try to do f of zero, I get one over zero, and then that's undefined. That's undefined. So for our domain, all we have to do is we just have to leave out zero. But that gets a little bit tricky writing down the interval notation. Okay. So the way we write down the interval notation for this one is we can go all the way negative as far as we want to go. So we'll start at negative infinity. And then the only number that gives us any trouble is zero. So when we get to zero, we have to leave that number out. So we'll have a parenthesis of zero. But that only gives us half of the domain. That's like just the left side of the number line. Because if we pick back up right after zero, we've got a bunch more numbers that'll work and we can keep going all the way to infinity. And then since we have two pieces, we need to put those together for our domain. So we have this little U looking symbol called the union symbol. That just means it puts those two pieces together. Put those two pieces together. So if we're leaving just zero out, this is what it would look like. Okay. Anytime you leave just one number out of the number line and you write it down in interval notation, it's going to look really similar to this. Okay. And the number that we leave out will be on both sides with a parenthesis because we're leaving that number out. And then we'll take the two pieces and we'll glue them together with this union symbol that you. And that's a button in WebAssign. And it'll give you that symbol. Don't put negative one in the bracket and then the bracket and then one. Okay, good question. Yeah, good question. So her question, let's think about it on the number line. She's saying what if we go to like negative one and then pick back up at one. And so like this part and this part. The problem with that is zero is not the only number in between these. Because there's other numbers, right? Like, so we want to leave out zero. So kill that one. But there are other numbers in here, like um, negative one half or uh, positive one third. So if we try to do something like that, then we're missing some numbers. So the only way we can leave out just zero is to go all the way up to zero, but leave out just zero, and then pick back up right after zero, and then go get them. Yeah, yeah I know. Yeah, that's that's not normal to think about. So that's, that's a really good question. Can we get that? All right. So the idea. On this one, if we have a variable in the denominator, is we can't let our denominator be zero. It's not always going to be just x down here. So sometimes we have to work a little harder to figure out what would make the denominator zero. So let's look at another one. Same big picture, but So, what about that function? Okay. So on this one, same same big idea. Okay, we don't want the denominator to be zero because that'll make our function undefined. But it's not super easy to just look at it and tell what would make the denominator zero. So what we can do in that case is we just take the denominator, just like we did with the other one, we take the denominator and set it equal to zero. 
And when we solve that, that'll, that will tell us what x value makes the bottom zero. So here we add 7 to both sides. Divide both sides by 2. We get 7 over 2. So the number that we need to leave out of our domain is 7 over 2, or 3 and a half, if you want to think about it as a mixed number. So when we write down our domain, we can start at negative infinity, and then when we run into trouble is when we get to 7 over 2. So I'm going to write down 7 over 2, but we need to leave that number out, so I put a parenthesis. Then we're going to pick back up right after 7 over 2, so another parenthesis, 7 over 2. And after this problem number, any number bigger than that works, so we can go to infinity. And then since we have the two pieces, we do a union symbol. So you see how it looks really similar to the last one, it's just the number has changed. Instead of having 0 on both spots, we've got 7 over 2. So once you kind of get the idea of what it's going to look like, it's not that bad. Okay, writing that down. Okay. I'm going to do one more. It's a little bit tricky. So this last one, just because you have a variable in the denominator doesn't necessarily mean that you've always got a number to leave out of the domain. So let's look at one where that's the case. Now, 1 over x squared plus 1. So the thing we don't want to happen, we don't want our denominator to be 0. I can't look at that and find a value that works. Maybe you think negative 1, but that negative 1 squared gives you 1. So if we tried to solve it like we did on the other, so we said x squared plus 1 equals 0. Then we would subtract 1 from both sides. And if we take the square root, we would get plus or minus square root of negative 1. What's the problem with that? Negative Square root of negative 1 is i, so we get plus or minus i. And we don't care about complex number. So we, we're not worried if a complex number would make this thing undefined because we're not dealing with complex numbers. We're only dealing with real numbers. So as far as real numbers, we can use any real number we want to. And so our domain on this one is negative infinity to positive infinity. Any x we plug in will work, any real number. So there's our domain talk. Now we can go back and talk about how to figure out the domain when we add two functions or subtract two functions or multiply or divide. Okay. So let's go back to our first set of notes here. So if we're adding two functions together, the domain of our new function is going to be any x value that's in the domain of both of the functions that we're using to make our new function. So our domain for that first one would be all x's in the domains of f and g. Okay. 
So what that's saying is if there's some x value that's in the domain of f, and it's in the domain of g, then it'll be in the domain of our new function. If it's only in the domain of f, not in the domain of g, it's not in the domain of the new one, and vice versa. Okay. So the way we figure these things out, okay, if we're about to make a new function, then we what we can do is we can write down the domain of f, write down the domain of g, and look to see where they overlap. Okay. So anything that's in both of these domains is going to be in the domain of the new function. And it turns out that's true okay, for the first three. Okay. So if we add two functions, subtract two functions, or multiply two functions, the way we figure out the domain is that all the x is in the domain of both the functions that we use to make the new function. Okay. Yep, which way can you go? This way? Yeah. Here we are. For division, it's almost the same thing, but division's always got to be a troublemaker. For division, starts out the same way. It's all x's in the domains. F and G and where G of X is not equal to zero. Okay. That's our, we just have to add that piece of information on because there could be some X that's in the domain of G but if there's an x value that makes g zero, we have to leave that number out when we're talking about the domain of the new function. Got that written down? Okay, so now let's actually deal with some functions. The domain's the harder part. Making the new functions, we're just adding, subtracting, multiplying, or dividing. It's not a, not a big deal. Okay. So let's see. So we're going to take f of x is equal to x, and g of x. Equal to three x, and let's find a new function. Let's find f plus g of x. Okay. So the rule says, and you don't have to write this step down every time. It just says if we want to add these, it would just be f of x plus g of x. Okay. f of x, what is f of x? It's x, and g of x is 3x. And if we combine like terms, sometimes there's simplifying you can do, sometimes there's not. So don't panic if there's not anything you see to do when you get it written down. On this one, we can combine like terms and we'll get 4x. There's our new function. What about the domain? Okay. So, to figure out the domain of our new one, we need to think about the domains of the two we started with. So, the domain of f, do we have a square root in f? Do we have a variable and a denominator? So it's all real numbers, it's just negative infinity to infinity. Okay. 
for g, we don't have a square root, we don't have a variable in the denominator, so our domain for g is just negative infinity to infinity. So for our new function, our domain is going to be all the numbers that are in this one, the first, negative infinity to infinity, and in this one. So what numbers are in both of these? All of them. Okay. So the domain of our new function is negative infinity to infinity. We don't have to leave anything out. Had all row numbers for both of our other two functions, so all row numbers is the domain of our new function. Okay. If we were doing subtraction with that one, if we wanted f minus g, the only thing that's any different at all on that problem is that the plus sign is a minus sign, so we'll have x minus 3x, so we'll end up with negative 2x. The domain's the same thing. Okay. None. That part's not hard. Okay. What about, if we'll stay with these two functions, what about um, if we multiplied? Okay. Again, you don't have to write this step down every time, but our rule says that's just f of x times g of x. f of x is just x times g of x is 3x. So if we multiply those x times 3x, what are we going to get? 3x squared. So there's our new function. What about the domain? Okay. Our domain is going to be the same as it was on this one, right? Because the domain's everything that's in the domain of f and in the domain of g. Everything's in the domain of f, everything's in the domain of g, so everything's in the domain of our new function. So it's negative infinity to positive infinity again. Questions on those two? They're not bad, especially if you get the do domain idea down. All right, now let's do the troublemaker. Let's do division. Oh, and as it turns out, some of the web assigned problems you've got to do like multiples, like it'll give you two functions. It'll say find plus, find minus, find times. So the domain for plus, minus, and times are all going to be the same. The only one that might be different is division. So let's find f divided by g. So our rule says that's f of x over g of x. f of x is x. g of x is 3x. We can simplify. We can cancel an x on the top and on the bottom. What's that leave us with on the top? One. Yeah, one. Yeah. So we get that's okay. So we get one third. But be careful. You can't just think about the domain from looking at one third. Because the domain, if you just look at this part, would be all real numbers. No, we don't even have an x in there. What we have to think about is we have to think about how it was made. We have to think about the two functions that we made it with. So the domain for the top is all row numbers. The domain for the bottom is all row numbers. But we have to think about what would make the bottom 0. So what would make 3x 0 if x was what? So 3 times x. So 3 times... 0 would give us 0. So we can't let the x be 0 because it'll make the denominator 0. And then we can't cancel if it's 0. Okay. 
So when we write down our domain, it would be our own numbers, but we've got to leave out zero. Okay. Can't have x equals zero. So for our domain, it's everything except zero, and we've written that one down. Looks like that. Okay. Um, if there, if yeah, if there's no way that the bottom function can be zero, then you don't have to worry about it. Really. Yeah, like we saw um, not that one, x squared plus one. You can't make that zero with real numbers. So yeah, yeah. Okay. So let me find us another one here. All right. So two new functions. Let's do the. Okay, we'll call f of x. We'll keep it simple. We'll just let it be x. G of x. I'm going to make square root of x. Okay. So if you want to, we can go ahead and think about the domains on these. So for f of x, is there any x value that won't work? There's no square root. There's no... Um, denominator we have to worry about, so, you know, so its domain is going to be negative infinity to infinity. For g of x, what can we not let happen with square root? We can't have what kind of numbers under there? Can't have negative numbers. Zero is okay, so our domain for g of x would start at zero and then go to infinity. Okay. That one's kind of ugly. So now let's let's work with these. Okay. So let's do f plus g of x. Well, let's do minus because we did plus last time, so we'll do minus on this one. So that's supposed to be f of x minus g of x. So that's x minus g of x is square root of x. And we don't have any like terms to combine here or anything, so that's our finished product. There. We're done with the function part. What we need now is a domain. So our domain on this one is going to be just the numbers that are in the domain of f and in the domain of g, so f has everything. g only has zero to infinity, so what's our domain gonna be on our new one? Zero to infinity, because we can't have any of the negative stuff because of this one, so that means we can't have any negative x's on this one either. And you can see that if you look, it's still got square root. So our domain on our new function, Still zero to infinity. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Do division. That is the other tricky one. Plus and multiply. You just add the x plus square root of x, x times square root of x. There's nothing to even do to simplify there. And division is our troublemaker. So. So we'll have get x over square root of x. You don't have to worry about simplifying. A web assign will take that just fine. And so there's our function. At this time, what's our domain? It's going to be, right, we can't have negatives, just like we couldn't have negatives on this one. But then we also have to check to see if there's anything in here that's left that would make our denominator zero. What value of x would make square root of x zero? Zero, 
All right, if we plug in zero, we'll get square root of zero, zero. So this whole thing will be undefined. So that means we have to leave zero out. So what changes? Instead of being zero to infinity with a bracket, we've got to leave zero out. So it will be zero with a parenthesis to infinity. Because the only difference is we have to leave out zero. Zero won't work. So we get a parenthesis instead of a bracket. Questions there? Okay. Mm -hmm. So how do you know you're leaving out the bracket? So a bracket is if zero is included if you want to use zero, and a parenthesis if you need to leave zero out, yeah. or whatever number it is. Yeah. yeah. So bracket means we're using that number. Parenthesis means we're not using that number. Except we had we do have the one exception is when we're talking about infinity, they always have parentheses. And they always have parentheses. Okay. Right. Um, well, I forgot to something I forgot to announce before we got started, and then we got one other one other little operation to do here. Okay. Um, what you got? Oh yeah, yeah. Is that good? Yeah. So test two. Okay. Um, Looking like it's going to be March 17th. So that's the Thursday before spring break. Okay. So that way you don't forget everything over the break. Okay. All right. So hang in there. We got one more, one more operation to do. Okay. One more operation to do. Um, and that's called composition. And composition of function. Okay. So the way this looks, hey, um, take note because you got to know what the notation means. I always have people that get confused with the notation. Okay, so. It'll look like this, and you've probably seen it before. We've got an F with an open circle of G. So some people call them fog and golf when you're doing, doing that. So what that notation means is that we want to find F of G of X. So whichever one's closest to the X is going to go inside of the other function. So what we're doing is we're taking one function and using it as an input to another function. This is not hard, but it can be really confusing if you don't don't pick up on what's going on. Okay, we're taking the output from one function, so we're taking the output for g and using that as the input in f. So we've got these things like chained together. So we would call this um, F composed with G. Or usually the way most people read it, we would say F of G of X. So, two ways we need to be able to use this. Um, first way, so let's get two functions. One thing that makes it a little confusing is because when we write our two functions down, we use x for both of them. And so you got x's in both functions. Okay. So let's find 
if composed with g of 2. So what this means, what this notation means, is we want f of g of 2. So what we do is we take 2, we plug it in to g. So if we do that, we'll have 2 squared. So it's f of 2 squared. 2 squared is 4. And now that we know the answer to the G problem, we take it and use it as the input in F. So we'll have 4 plus 1 gives us 5. So we've got to kind of have a chain we have to follow, okay? So we take our input to, first we're going to put it into G. When we do that, that means we, do, we square it, so 2 squared. 2 squared is 4. Once we know that, we take 4 and use it as our input in F. So 4 plus 1 gives us 5. Okay. Yeah, you got yeah, you to do G first and do F, yeah. So the one that's closest to the X or to the number, you'll do it first. Take the output of that and plug it into the other one. Okay. What if it said this? Well, if we want, my circle's not very good there. Well, if we want G... G composed with F of 3. Okay. So the G and the F are switched around this time. Okay. So which one's going to go on the inside, F or G? F's going to go on the inside. So for this one, we would want to find G of F of 3. Okay. So first, we would take 3, put it in the input for F, so that'll be 3 plus 1, so that's g of 3 plus 1, which is 4. Okay. And then we take 4, put it in the input of g, so that means we'll find 4 squared. Four squared gives us sixteen. Hmm? Yeah. I'll still get you out there, right? All right, so that's one way we use these, and that's when we have a number involved. That's usually the shortest way to shortest way to do it. The other way we could use composition is to make a new function, not just get a number out, but to actually get a function out as our answer. Okay. So I'm just going to, I'm going to copy down our two functions so we don't have to scroll back and forth. Okay. So these problems, instead of giving us a number, it'll say, Find F composed with G of X. Okay. So this thing means F of G of X. Okay. But we know what G of X is. G of X is X squared, so we just swap. Instead of calling it g of x, we'll call it x squared. Okay. 
So then to find f of x squared, we just take x squared and we put it in the place of x in our other function. So instead of x plus 1, we get x squared plus 1. So there's our new function. Questions on that one? Yeah, yes, it is like Inception. You're exactly right. I didn't know if people still watched that movie, so. But if we switch the order, this time F will go on the inside, so we want G of F of X. f of x is x plus 1, so we want g of x plus 1. So if we use x plus 1 as the input into g, instead of x squared, we'll get x plus 1 squared. Most of the time, when you switch the order, you're going to get a different answer. Okay? There are cases where you get the same thing doing it both ways around. We'll look at that in the, in the next section. Okay? You don't have to worry about domain on those. Okay? It gets a little extra confusing. So we'll just worry about domain on plus, minus, multiply, and divide. Okay? Okay. Okay, that's it. Make a break for it if you're squirmy. <laughs>